This is the Geek Gab, the Geek Delicious Gab Fest with your host, Daddy Warpigs. And Daddy Warpig, man, I am so big and so awesome. I am plural now. And my co hosts, Brian Nehemiah and Doranall, broadcasting as always live from the secret bunker deep underneath the house of geekery. You can catch me online, daddywarpig.com, daddywarpig.com. You can also catch Brian Niemeyer online at brianniemeyer.com, oddly enough. And just a quick reminder, if you don't know how to spell our names, the links are, as always, in the description. All three of us also on Twitter you want to drop by, say hi, ask us questions, beg us to talk about some topic, just remember, this is all fun, no work Sunday, an hour of pure geekalicious gab. I'm going to slow down for just a second and grab a drink of water while I allow my co-hosts to get a word in edgewise. Take it away, Brian. I like how you're using the plural of majesty now. It suits you. As many majesties as we can fit into one cast. That's what Daddy Warpig is, right? I'm a hey. hey, everybody. It's good to be here. All right. And I've, got, I've got some bad news. Um, Doranol has suffered some emotional trauma earlier today. And... Uh, I imagine, like a great many people are about to suffer in the next couple of hours, deep, scarring, emotional trauma. So if he seems a little bit off his game, if he seems a little bit distracted, maybe even a little bit sad, it is only because the Green Bay Packers just barely, barely, barely didn't destroy the Seahawks. Are you impressed I actually remember the names of those teams? I'm impressed, not because it's such an impressive thing, but because I'm astounded that I know that much about football. So Yeah, you know, I the thing that's worst about it is my therapist is a Seahawks fan, so <laughs> there's just no hope for me. Ouch. All right. Now, I have a super secret topic that I thought of earlier today that I want to bring up and discuss. Uh, and Doranol actually has some stuff that he thought would be fun to bring up on the show. As always, we take questions from the chat. Who's going to handle that now, anyway? I'm watching. Okay, okay. And then uh, I told Brian he could bring up anything he wants, because that's kind of the theme of the show, anything geeky goes. So I have no idea, though, if there's anything in specific that he wants to discuss today. Is there, is there anything that you found interesting or cool or, you know, something the audience might like or whatever? Well, I'll tell you, just today I went over to Steam and I purchased and downloaded Crypt of the Necrodancer beta version. Necrodancer? Is that, is that like some sort of undead rhythm game or something? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Well, I got that on the first try. Wait, no, that I was I was just being a wise ass. Is that seriously what it is? <laughs> so was I. Yes. Yes, it is. That's Not only that, fantastic. It's, it's also a uh, roguelike dungeon crawl. Wait, did you say Necromancer or Necrodancer? The second one. Okay, so I totally missed that. It, it's it's an indie game, right? Yeah. Do you do you play it with like a pad or your keyboard or? Either you can use your keyboard because the only controls in it are up, down, left, and right, and combinations thereof. So you could use a dance pad. I, I'm stunned. I'm, I'm That's stunned. wonderful. I did, tell, tell me more. I, I'm, I'm clicking now. This is great. Sure. Uh, if you want a rundown of it, I don't know if you guys ever check out Red Letter Media. They're the guys who did the uh, Plinket Star Wars Episode One review. Uh huh. We, we, we love the Star Wars Episode One reviews in the in the uh, all three of them all three of the show we love those reviews at the House of Geekery as do all well-meaning people so 
Yeah, they uh, they do some regular online content, and one is a show called Previously Recorded, all about video games. I did not know that. Yes, and right now they've got uh, an episode up on Crypto the Necrodancer. Uh, I, I think it's a very informative review, and it got the two hosts, Jack and Rich, more excited about a game than, than I've ever seen them get. Normally uh, pretty staid and laid back about it. And they're just raving about it, so I give it a try. And for Dornall's benefit, yeah, you play um, a young lady whose uncle was abducted by the title villain, the Necrodancer, and so she digs down into his crypt to try to get him back. And her heart is enchanted or stolen or something by the Necrodancer. So you've, you've got a meter on the screen that keeps time with the beat. It's like a metronome, and it's a little heart that beats in time to the music, and you've got to move in time to the beat. And the more that you move in time to the beat, the higher your multiplier goes, where you get more treasure for defeating enemies. And then you can buy stuff, and when you buy things in the shop, you don't get it right away. It, um, well, you can get it right away, but it also makes it appear in chess around the around the map. It, do, do they play music? Are you doing this in response to music, or is it just the metronome, just the beat? Oh, there it has a killer soundtrack. But you can also upload your own MP3s. That's that's taken it to the next level. I love that. On Steam, you say? It is on Steam, yes. And it's in beta. It is a beta version. They warn you of that, but it's still pretty tight. I didn't notice any major glitches or bugs or inconsistencies or anything. Did um, and that, I'm assuming it's an indie game, right? Correct. I think it's so, by uh, Brace Yourself is the name of the studio. So you've had a chance to download it, but you haven't yet. You haven't yet had a chance to play it. Oh, I was playing it all afternoon before this. That's what I was oh, just. Oh, okay. Doing. It's addictive. <laughs> Sounds like it. I'm seriously considering downloading it, though I don't know if it's going to run on my computer. I, I, it is intriguing enough, at least, to check out. Oh, man. If I can run it, you probably can. I mean, I'm working with, like, an 80-year-old Dell here. I'm, uh, I'm a Macintosh user. They yeah. have it for Mac. Oh, but do they? Oh, okay. Yeah. And I think I saw Linux, too, so you should be good. Yeah, it looks like it's uh, it's available on all of those platforms. See, that was the great thing about the advent of Linux, is so many geeks started running a Unix system that if mm. you make something for a Unix system, any Unix system, you can pretty much, just by recompiling, get it to run on uh, Mac. You can get it to run, even if you have to run it through X Windows. Uh, I have a full X Windows environment available. Mm -hmm. um, and... They have this, there's a program called Wine. Wine is not an emulator. It was actually all the Windows APIs implemented in code for Linux. And so um, you could run many, many Windows programs, not just games, but they took Wine and modified it and wrapped it around a bunch of Windows games and then started selling them commercially because now you could run them on OS X. So they actually had, and I'm talking about, Sid Meier's Alpha Centauri, one of my all-time mm. favorite games. Um, the original release version was so long ago that it just stopped working in like 2005, I think. You could no longer run it. They released a beta version that kept you running for another year, but the advancing operating system and then the shift to Intel processors killed it, so you can't run it anymore. And so... Uh -huh. GOG has it now where you can buy it and download it and run it, and what you're actually running is the Windows executable inside of Wine. And I suspected that was the case, but the only reason I actually know is when it crashed once, it threw up a Wine dialog box, and I'm like, yes, I knew that was what was going on. I have a friend who's heavy into Wine. Like contributing it or just using it? I don't drink at all. <laughs> oh, zing. I mean, someone had to make it. I wasn't just going to leave it there. <laughs> but yeah, I, I know he uses it big time. He's a big Linux buff. I, I'm sure he's got the the chops to contribute, but I don't know if he has the time. I'll have to ask him. 
I don't. I used to know people who work on open source projects, but I don't know. I mean, other other than like on Twitter, uh, I don't know anyone who actually contributes anymore. They all got old and realized they had to spend their time with their kids and <laughs> instead yeah. of coding. It's an old story. All right, I want to. Unless I'm unless there was anything else about the Necro Dancer, we should know. Okay, actually, there is one question I want to know. What kind of music is on the soundtrack? Well, of of course, it's all danceable, so it's very much house, kind of techno, pop synth kind of stuff, but in different genres. So, you know, there's more general dance music in the earlier levels, but, like, the first boss is, spoiler alert, a gorilla named King Konga, <laughs> and there's Konga music playing in, in the background with a conga line of zombies following him. So <laughs> oh, That's great. It is. It really is. <laughs> oh. Yeah, and you can get the soundtrack on its own if you want. Is it all original music, or do they license it? I think it's original. Wow. Okay. This is another digression, just because I felt like it. Does okay. anybody, either of you, or anybody in the audience know what EDM is as far as music goes? Well, you mean you, well, it stands for electronic dance music. Okay. I just I haven't seen that term before and I saw it like three or four times in the last couple of weeks. I'm just wondering if that was some hip new genre of music that came out that I knew nothing about, like dubstep. Dubstep snuck up on me. I didn't know what dubstep was until I heard it in like movie soundtracks, and then it was in one, then it was in another, then everybody had it in movie soundtracks, and now it's gone away. I liked dubstep. I downloaded a bunch of dubstep, but you know, I was one of those. I was one of those people the hipsters sneer at because uh, I, I didn't even know what dubstep was until everybody already knew. Uh, until I was like the lone kid at the back saying, "So, like, is rock and roll? Is that cool? Do you guys like that stuff? Is that?" Stuff? <laughs> Yeah, it's embarrassing, but I'm used to it. Uh, that's why I'm willing to ask this question. So electronic dance music, is it just a new term for stuff, or is it just a term everybody uses and only I am I'm now just noticing? No, no, it's, it's fairly new because, I mean, when we were growing up and electronic music was, um, like, electronic music's been, like, steadily rising in popularity since even before we were around. But, uh, you know, we used to call it, like, techno or electronica, and, and you know, sometimes those terms sort of, refer to kind of specific genres of electronic music, but EDM doesn't refer to a particular genre, and I haven't noticed it... Uh, I first noticed it like a year or two ago. Okay. Um, which is really weird, because there's actually a genre of music called EBM, which is, uh, you know, very old. Electronic body music, which is another name for... Um, a lot of people use that interchangeably with industrial. Um, oh. You know, industrial, I know, because I was yeah. a Nine Inch Nails fan. <laughs> exactly, and and EBM um, with the B, as in boy, is uh, that that refers to more of the um, the dancey synth pop style of music, um, as opposed to the um, Nine Inch Nails KMFDM sort of. You know, they brought in a lot of yeah. you know a lot of rock sounds, a little bit of metal sounds, and you know, anybody who's listened to those types of music sort of can tell the difference. Is, so is not, so red... that's like a condenser mic thrown in a washing machine. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> is is gotcha. Nitsa technically industrial? Yeah. Yeah, Nitsa Reb is definitely, um, definitely industrial. Um, but there's a whole spectrum, right? Because then you can go all the way to the end of kind of like garbage synth pop stuff like Depeche Mode. Absolutely love Depeche Mode. And then you go all the other way. And then you get acts that... Um, maybe started off industrial, and then they, they sort of turned into some sort of weird metal music, like uh, like Ministry. And where you're like, that's wait, that's not kind of the same thing, but they're all kind of thrown in the same bucket. Here's the, I love it when stuff like that happens, and I'll tell you why, because I just found this out like three years ago. I went through all the stuff in iTunes because I wanted to have songs that I actually knew what they were, and so I was assigning real genres to it, which required me, well, it didn't require me, it allowed me to geek out and start reading up on histories of different genres of music. And this is the one coolest thing I found ever. 
I didn't start listening to pop music, to music at all, until I moved back to the United States when I was 10. And I was like a native-born immigrant. I knew nothing about American culture. I didn't see American uh, TV shows. I didn't see American, didn't listen to American music. I saw movies very, very regularly. So I was brand new, got dumped into American pop culture. And the very first thing I saw on TV when I moved back to the United States was Michael Jackson doing the moonwalk. It was Looking back on it, it's the most surreal thing that is literally true. Um, and so I started, MTV had, was like four years old at the time. So I started watching MTV because they had music videos. And so the original body of music that I love is pretty much defined by music videos that were on MTV in the early and mid-1980s. So if you wanted to throw a dart at that body of music, you'll probably hit something I like. Part of that body of music is new age music. And that's the cars, right? It's that poppy, happy, light stuff. Um, Do you mean new age or new wave? New wave. Sorry, I meant new wave. New it's wave. I mean like Yanni. And yeah, no, no, no. And new wave. You're right, you're right. <laughs> New wave music, and this is what I thought was awesome that I found out when I was doing research into the genre. Most new wave musicians, most of the original ones, were all punk rockers. Oh yeah, I just it blew my mind that the cohorts of the Sex Pistols and all of those punk rock bands, the defiant, angry, loud punk rock bands became new wave. And I was like, are you kidding me? Holy crap. <sighs> Loved it. You, yeah. sound, you sound like you know something about it, so go ahead. Pitch in. <laughs> well, you probably know more than I do, but I just know that you know, guys like Elvis Costello and the B-52s were hanging out at CBGB together, you know, with the Ramones and I mean I haven't studied it in depth um, what I, I I had a buddy that I went to grade school with been in a couple bands with and he's just a walking encyclopedia of that era of music in particular like he really loved Joy Division and New Order and Depeche Mode so quite often I get lectures on this stuff and it's been a few years so you know please excuse me if I have uh, Got some of my information mixed up. But uh, don't know might find this interesting. This guy's brother-in-law got to hang out with Depeche Mode at their New York studio. Like, back in the 90s. Oh, wow. Yeah, and they actually, like, helped him finish writing a song he was working on. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, it blew me away when I heard it. So, true story, though. That would be that would be really really cool. Oh, Marco in the comments. Joy Division turned it a new order. Who I like a lot of new order stuff, but they have one of the most perverse distribution uh, schemes in the world. They wanted to make it. I think they wanted to make it impossible for people to actually collect mm -hmm. their stuff. And instead, what they did is they made all of their collectors, like, they would release different singles in different countries or different um, places. Sometimes, like, for one Australian release, all the albums, two of the songs were deliberately reversed. Uh, they swapped them. Yeah. Um, My buddy they, has all of those. He spent a considerable amount of time and money and effort getting a whole catalog. So that's totally true. And, and then they what they did was, instead of making it so that nobody could collect it, they just made it so that it was, like, freaking impossible mm -hmm. to collect it, just super expensive to do. And so they made it even more elite than it was supposed to be to go in. I just thought that was hilarious. I mean... Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. No, no, that was it. I just... He was mentioning New Order. That's the one thing that pops into my mind when I hear New Order is... Um, yeah. That and substance abuse. <laughs> I think substance is one of their uh, albums, isn't it? It is. Substance is one of their albums. Substance yeah. abuse is not. What substance <laughs> abuse is is a bootleg album somebody assembled out of a bunch of singles uh, of substance. 
And so it okay. only exists in illicit format. You can only – and they didn't do this. This is a fan that did this. It only exists on, like, torrent sites and music boards and stuff. So you only know about it if you hear about it from someone like me or if you ran into it on uh, various torrents. Uh, and so a lot of their really, really strange stuff, like DJ services at dance clubs, they will license a single and then remix it with uh, with with their own style of stuff and then license that out, sell those to, uh, to various dance halls, to clubs and DJs. Um, Razor Maid is an example. So one of their songs has a Razor Maid version that I love. It's awesome. It's a great New Order song, but you can only get it uh, illicitly because Razor Maid can't legitimately, or at least up until a few years ago, couldn't legitimately sell it to the audience. They could only sell to DJs and dance clubs and stuff. Right. Um, but one of the songs in Substance Abuse is um, is a Razor Maid remix of one of their singles. Fascinating. <laughs> I just if I just revealed too much about my uh, about my shady <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> we'll leave my uh, hints absolutely untrue hints. I want to make a categorical denial that I've ever done anything that the RIAA would ever be interested in. I am not that guy. Leave that behind us. Because <laughs> um, Dornall had some had some stuff he ran across yesterday he wanted to he wanted to talk about. Yeah, so to switch gears completely, I don't know if you guys have been uh, checking out the movies lately, but none of them seem good. Anyway, it's Oscar it's season. January. Yeah, it's January. It's uh it's it's Oscar season and uh and uh we went out to see the new-ish movie, American Sniper, which I guess I guess it just got a it had a limited release in 2014, which is why it's up for Academy Awards and everything. I don't know why I mentioned that. I don't like Academy Awards; they're pointless. Indeed. But I will mention that uh, the movie was great, and it, but what I saw something almost I want to say I saw something greater before the movie, and I really want to talk about this before we get to the movie. I saw the trailer for the brand new Mad Max movie. Oh, yeah. And I hadn't seen this before. And seeing the, just the trailer on the big screen is amazing. They've got this look and feel, this pure pulp look and feel with all the, the crazy close-ups and the camera angles and, and the nutty action and the sets and the costuming. Uh, yeah, it is it is that crazy post-apocalyptic fantasy and it's got a real grindhouse feel to it. And by the time that trailer had finished, I had forgotten what movie I had paid to see. Now, have you seen the originals? I, I haven't. Um, I shouldn't say that, although I effectively haven't. I, I mean, it's it's been so long since I've seen any of them that... So this raises a question in my mind. Now, do you, do you think, and uh, both of you guys... Would it be better for someone to pop his Mad Max cherry by watching Fury Road, the new one first, and then going back and watching Mel Gibson ones? Or should you go in order, you know, and watch Mad Max, you know, all the way up through Thunderdome, and then, you know, now check out the uh, the, the gritty reboot we got coming out? I do... I did not plan, or I do not plan on going back and and watching the Mel Gibson ones. I, I plan on just enjoying that because I think from from what I saw, what they're trying to present, like the movie they're trying to present, uh, seems awesome. And I, I don't feel that I need any more context than what I already have. Yeah, if they I do it right, they you shouldn't. It's not like continuity was a big deal with the Mad Max movies anyway. I mean, they have the <laughs> same actor in three all three of the movies, the same actor playing different roles. Um, just because, and he's like the most striking guy. He's tall, he's skinny, he looks like his face got squeezed um, from the sides, and so it was stretched out. Uh, in the third one, in Thunderdome, he flew a, uh, he flew a, a plane thing. Um, but yeah, so they don't care about continuity. There wasn't a lot of strong continuity between the three anyway, so right. it's not like you're missing out on a plot. It's not a trilogy. There are three 
independent, totally independent movies. Uh, I don't know. I, uh, to respond to Brian's question, though, that's a real good question. It depends on who you are, because the other two movies are both Australian indies. Oh, I just unconsciously erased Thunderdome. I'm sorry. No, literally, I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> Did you save a backup somewhere at least? <laughs> um, the Road Warrior and Mad Max are both Australian indies that were made on shoestring budgets and are really rough in a couple of spots. So if you're okay with that, if you can handle that, then I'd say go watch them. They're a lot of fun. Um, but like, and I guess I'll talk about this when I get to the secret topic I wanted to bring up, but there's a lot of good stuff that comes from making something that is micro-budget rather than mega-budget. Um, if you're okay with those kinds of movies, if you like those kinds of movies, 70s era, early 80s era, uh, low-budget indies, then by all means, you know, Road Warrior and Mad Max pretty much defined the look of post-apocalypse forever. I mean, at least for, for all the time since then, for 40 years. Um, in fact, if you played Fallout 3 or Fallout New Vegas, uh, and I'm not saying it doesn't hold for Fallout 1 or 2, I've just never played Fallout 1 or 2. If you played New Vegas or Fallout 3, the raiders who live in the wasteland, the psychopathic cannibals, they're all dressed like bad guys from the Mad Max movies. All of that dark football armor, big padding with, you know, that that's Mad Max. That's who came up with it, was the director who made these movies. And so he has basically written every single, the aesthetics, the visual aesthetics, and every single post-apocalyptic movie since then. So they're absolutely seminal movies. Anything that is post-apocalyptic, I mean, if you've seen Waterworld, the look of Waterworld, not the dumb script and the events, but the look of the um, bad guys is all straight Mad Max. So if that makes it sound interesting, go ahead, watch them. They're awesome. Um, if, on the One other hand, you just want a great movie, this looks like it'll be a great movie. One thing I'd add, and one thing I like about the Road Warrior, Mad Max, and uh, Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome is that George Miller, the director of all three, and now the fourth one, is a medical doctor. Like, he actually has his, his MD, and he used it to make the wounds and the gore and the blood more realistic. Hmm. So, like, one thing you'll notice is that uh, as Max goes along, his clothing diminishes, and, like, not raggedly, but, like, he'll lose a pant cuff and he loses a sleeve, and that's because the EMTs will not waste time when they come to take your broken body off the pavement to gently remove your shirt and fold it. They will just cut your sleeve off to get to the wound. And it shows that he's had, like, you know, his clothes cut off to treat his injuries. That's awesome. That's a little bit of authenticity, yeah. Oh, yeah, I didn't expect that. That's awesome. I love to see details like so, that. So, so I, after hearing the answers, Brian, what, what do you think? Yeah, you obviously like this stuff. Should should I go back and, and watch the original stuff to look for... Well, like you mentioned, I'm a big fan of Grindhouse Cinema. And especially Australian. Like, I saw a whole documentary on that, which is another subject for another time. But, yeah, I would say in your case, um, just going to Fury Road clean with no preconceptions from the other movies. But I would advise you to, after that, just go back and at least watch Road Warrior and see how it holds up. You know, see how Miller's style has evolved over time. Fair enough. I'll probably, do, well, I'll definitely do that if it's easy to stream. Which is going to be harder. I think as soon as, as soon as a new property comes out, somebody jumps on the uh, rights to stream. <laughs> hmm. That happened to me with uh, Twin Peaks. I don't know if I told you guys this. I was, uh, no. I, was in, I was in the middle of watching Twin Peaks. I was somewhere a couple episodes into the second season. And, uh, and then uh, we switched to Amazon Prime for a couple of reasons. But then... They made the announcement about the 20th year anniversary of Twin Peaks, where they were talking about maybe, you know, 
making good on their promise in the first season that they'd actually come back in 20 years. And then mm-hmm. uh, as soon and as soon as that happened, um, Twin Peaks was no longer available to stream. Like I had to pay for it. And and I didn't know that I didn't know this at the time. I didn't know all that stuff about the rights. But you know, I finally I finally actually asked Amazon help and saying, you know, what the fuck, <laughs> what, what happened? And they're like, oh yeah, Netflix bought the rights as soon as they made that announcement. And oh. I went, oh. So that's gonna be the same thing. I'm I'm sure Mad Max. Uh, whoever owns the uh, rights to Mad Max is probably uh, clamping down on that so they can make a little extra money. Wouldn't I'm, doubt I'm, it. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I just wouldn't doubt it. I'm hoping this is what I was... My highest hopes for uh, the new Mad Max movie is that it'll make them go back and re-release The Road Warrior in HD on iTunes so I can download it. Uh, Because it's only available in SD. And Frankly, I think people who only have movies in standard definition on iTunes are just... They're just leaving money lying there in the street that they could pick up for nothing. Um especially people who have it available in HD but only to rent. I just I want to sit down and sit down with their doctors and their therapists and say, look, you need to adjust this person's meds because they are nuts. They have no idea what they're doing. They could be mega gajillionaires, and, and they're not. They're just leaving money there. That seems strange to me. Not that I'm bitter about it or anything. Obviously not. <laughs> Right. So, Mad Max, great trailer. Looking forward to the movie. That's my opinion. Yeah, uh, I was just as excited about that as the actual movie I saw. Was there any other trailers that struck you as interesting? Not not enough that I can remember right now. Um, there, there are a lot of previews, but uh, nothing nothing stood out quite like that. Uh, and I just went to three movies on Saturday, so I saw three sets of trailers. Well, and... I probably know what all the movies coming out are because none of them seem... I don't remember any of them, what trailers I actually saw. Doesn't mean they're bad, it just... Maybe watching three movies push the trailers out of my memory. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thing, I guess. You didn't watch three crap movies. So okay. so have you had a chance to see the uh, see American Sniper yet? No, I do want to, though. And I, and I want to see it in the theater. I don't want to wait till it comes out on video because uh, it, it, it looks really really good and I've yeah. been hearing good things about it yeah it's it's great It's if you like war movies it's got enough of a war movie in there if you like your your gritty brutal dramas about real life uh, events you know it's got it's got that too and uh, you know Clint Eastwood's the director and he's been an amazing director for years now and, uh, and, it, and it really shows I think like overall overall it was a really great movie did you ever see The Hurt Locker? Yeah, I did. Um, similar, actually. Quite similar. Cool, well, because Eastwood and Bigelow are two of my favorite directors, so I think I'll take your recommendation and go to my local theater on free popcorn day. Check out American Sniper. Absolutely. If you, Especially if you liked The Hurt Locker. I'm glad you brought that up. If you like The Hurt Locker, it's very similar. Like It's it's you know a story about you know the guy, and he keeps going back to war, and, and how it you know the effect it has on him and everything. And it's, it's great. I haven't seen The Hurt Locker, but but I did not know it was directed by Catherine Bigelow. Uh, so I have seen... She did Zero Dark Thirty, right? Right. Which was an incredible movie. I loved that movie. She's just an amazing director all around. It was, it was a crying shame. I, I think actually what happened is this. Uh, all of a sudden, the movie had been out, and all of a sudden... Right before Oscars, it was time to vote. Suddenly, the big controversy breaks out about um, about suppose you know the torture that was in there, or the harsh questioning, or however you want to phrase it. Um, here's the thing: one of the other pictures also going up for best picture that year was a Miramax picture. Miramax are run by the Weinstein brothers. Um, oh, and they're not even Miramax anymore; they're the Weinstein Company now, I think. Um, and they are hardcore, nasty, elbow-throwing bastards when it comes to awards season because that's how they get their movies to make money is they do a theatrical release because they're all indie movies. That's what their company is for. It's distributing indie movies. They release a movie. It isn't going to make a whole ton because it's an indie, but if they can get an Oscar nomination or an Oscar win, then uh, 
that gets it out there, people know, oh, well, this is an Oscar winner, and then they make a ton of money because people rent it and buy it. Um, and he started a whole bunch of, um, I mean, just kind of shady stuff for to get his movie out there to people who vote in the Academy. There are literally people who are have been in the Academy for 50 or 60 years. They're in nursing homes. I'm not making this up. This is real. They're in nursing homes. So he sends people around to nursing homes to talk to these voters and get them to vote for his movies. I think, this is just my theory. I've never heard anybody uh, posit this or confirm this. It's my theory that the whole whispering campaign that broke out suddenly, like over the weekend, uh, that sank the movie almost instantly, was a result of Weinstein calling the right reporters at the right couple of papers in Hollywood and have, arranging to have the movie put to death in public loudly um, because of the controversy, which ensured that despite how awesome a movie it was, it would not get an Oscar. So when Doranall earlier was talking about how little respect he has for the Oscars, I have now hit that point because, not solely because of what happened with Zero Dark Thirty, but that did that certainly started me on the road to realizing, wow, these are a these are a jip. They don't, they're not very good. They don't get good stuff anymore. I'm gonna recommend a book to you guys. It's called Down and Dirty Pictures: Miramax, Sundance, and the Rise of Independent Film by Peter Biskind. Okay, I read a blogger who talked about that. Yes, it's basically about how Robert Redford, uh, Robert Redford, and the Weinstein's created and then destroyed American independent cinema. Because they got like tons of money flew into it all of a sudden after some yeah. after well, some Miramax skullduggery that you could suddenly start buying indies for. They just started dumping millions and millions of dollars for pictures that have been made for hundred thou or uh, ten thou or whatever. Well, they they do all kinds of underhanded stuff. Like um, they would go to like Sundance or Independent Film Festival or Con or something, and they would see a movie that they like the Weinstein's didn't necessarily want to buy, but they didn't want anyone else to have it either because it could be competition for a movie they did buy. So like they would start a bidding war to get the price way up, like out of their like to make people think that they were going to buy it so everyone else would walk away because, like, oh, well, we, we can't compete with them, especially after they got Disney money. And so all the investors would walk away and then they wouldn't buy it. So the director would leave empty-handed. They also, he literally would buy movies, buy the distribution rights, so they'd been public, they'd been made by directors, especially foreign movies, buy the distribution rights and then they would they go into his vault and they've never released them. And the people who sold the distribution rights to them can't release them in the United States. And they are pissed. Because there's a number of like Chinese um, martial arts movies in the vein of Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon um, that he owns in the United States and will not release. A lot of people are just angry about that because, I mean, they're looking, if this movie does well, or, or at least if it's a well-done movie, that's their ticket to getting a career. That's their ticket to being able to get called in and hired by a studio to make something, or maybe even to make like a super passion project. But when somebody buys the rights to it and sits on it, you don't have a way of getting your name uh, out to the public, and so your career is dead in the water unless you can get a another one of these made, and then get it released, and then it's good enough to get people's notice. So if you had a shot and he killed it, that really, really is aggravating to a lot of people. Hmm. Um, so that's the wine scene. That's my theory. Catherine Bigelow deserves an Oscar. I'm hoping she continues to make great movies because sooner or later uh, she should get an Oscar for something. Um, well, she did. Locker. This picture. She did. What'd she get an Oscar for? I missed that. Hurt Locker. Hurt Locker. Locker. Yeah. Oh. Hurt Locker falls into a really strange period of time in my life where I have no awareness of popular culture. Like I came out of it, and my first question after looking at the television for a couple of minutes, I turned to my mom and said, "Who the hell are the Kardashians?" <laughs> <laughs> you didn't miss out. So, so let me say this about um, can. Like, 
contrasting the two movies, because they're actually very similar movies, mm-hmm. The Hurt Locker and American Sniper. Um, one thing I couldn't help but think when I left the theater was, um, I think Jeremy Renner was much better at the part than Bradley Cooper was. And and I, I'm going to have to leave that to you guys to judge, because um, he's good in the movie, and you should definitely see the movie, but, but think about that afterwards. Jeremy Renner is a criminally under... Um, underrated actor. Well, I mean, he had to be Hawkeye, so... Just everything I've seen him in, he has just done an insanely good job at, and he has a nose that is best described as cute. It's just slightly bulbous, slightly pinched off, and so it looks cute. It doesn't look strong and masculine, and that pushes him into character actor roles, not leads. And I think that's what has kept him from being as big a star as his talent and hard work pushes him into. Because as an actor himself, the performances he's de- he delivers are just stunning. They're incredible. That's that, that's cool that you have that opinion, because I think the, the role that got him most of that work is his amazing performance in The Hurt Locker, and how, how good mm-hmm. that was, and how good the movie was. Oh, totally. It was Catherine Bigelow who was the first to really make the observation you guys did to say, that man is a star. Yeah. Uh, he was in SWAT, um, which is... Uh, he, he wasn't the lead, but he was in there. Um, and he, he did a great job in SWAT. He did a great job in um, The Town, which was the movie that finally convinced me that... Um, Ben Affleck was actually a stunningly good director. Um, yeah, that was a movie that raised Ben Affleck's career from the grave. Yeah. I mean, and Gone, uh, Gone Baby Gone, which was his previous one, was also great, but people were like, oh, well, that's just a fluke. You yeah. Know? Then exactly. the, the town came, and it was fabulous, and, and Jeremy Renner's performance was impeccable. Agreed. Um. And, of course, he was Hawkeye, and I thought he did a great job as Hawkeye. Thankless, shitty job, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so what's what's my power again? Ah, oh, fuck. <laughs> well, he seems like Hawkeye and Black Widow seem like the two Avengers who are never going to get their own solo movies. <laughs> yeah, actually, that was one of the best things about The Winter Soldier was how um, Black Widow actually had a movie where she could shine and, and be an important part of that movie. Yeah, because she was just kind of thrown in there for Iron Man 2. She didn't really have a core... They really belong. Yeah, and, and the Avengers is even worse. It's just well documented. She did have some great moments in the Avengers, but not... She didn't have a huge core role, because the Avengers, the core people in Avengers are Cap and Iron Man. Um, and, yeah. of course, Agent... What's his name? His name is Phil. Phil, Yeah. <laughs> Agent Coulson, sorry. I should know that. I've seen a season of that TV show. The Son of Cole. Oh, God, is that thing still on? It's still on. Apparently it got good. I haven't watched it yet, but I, I've been told it got good. Yeah, that's what I heard, too. Still hasn't gotten me to go back. Okay, I want to talk about Grindhouse, though. This is my secret topic. Um, we are... Where are we? What time is it? Okay, yeah, we got about 15 minutes left, so that should be enough time. Um, this is from Flashback. It's a site I, I've linked to from my blog occasionally. Um, the other site that did the top 10 or top 25 nude scenes from the 80s um, that I linked to, they, they did this list a couple days ago. It's 15 reasons the 1970s were the best decade in horror cinema. I could see that. Um, and they cite some great movies. They cite some good reasons. And when I was sitting here today thinking of a of a topic that I thought would be cool to discuss, I'm a fan of horror movies. I'm a fan of a lot of cheesy horror movies, but apparently I, ha- I have not pushed the needle on cheesy horror movies uh, to the max. Uh, Larry Correa, who I read... Um, is a fan of the beest of the B movies, almost Z movies, and he has seen movies that I have never seen and probably could never sit through. Um, 
And so I used to, you know, I used to pride myself on how much I loved bad horror movies. And then I found Jabutu.com savoring movies at the bottom end of the cinematic bell curve. And they watched movies I just physically could not sit through. They would bore me to tears. Uh, and then Larry Korea, both of those just convinced me that I may like bad horror movies, but it's possible to like truly awful horror movies. I just dropped dropped the link into um, into our chat. The private oh, I'm chat, reading it. Um, <laughs> if you wanted to take a look while I'm yammering on. Um, I have seen many of these movies, um, but not nearly, not even most. I think I've seen two or three of them, actually. Um, Last House on the Left, I've seen, and that was a brilliant, disturbing film. Um... So these are these are some of the things I'm not going to read all these, but these are some of the things that you were talking about that I happen to believe in greatly. The grit, um, and I'm going to read this just a little bit of this. To be truly horrifying, it's nice to have a degree of grittiness. Polished horror films rarely rarely horrify; they're just too clean looking to attack you on a visceral level. For whatever reason, horror films of the '70s often look like they had been marinated in a puddle on a gas station bathroom floor. Last House on the Left, for instance almost looks like a snuff film at times, as does I Spit on Your Grave and the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Modern horror has tried to recre recreate this grittiness, and while guys like Rob Zombie have given it a valiant effort, you just can't synthesize the magic that was the genuine grime of 70s horror. I've seen Last House on the Left, I've seen the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and I think I've seen I Spit on Your Grave. Um, but... I happen to agree with him totally. It's one of the reasons I think big budget horror films are generally speaking a mistake. It's one of the reasons that I think Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome was sunk is because you put too much movie into horror. It looks too clean. It looks too pretty. It looks too professional, and that robs a movie of some of the um, some of the visceral, overwhelming sense of of grime and threat and darkness that gritty movies bring to it. Thoughts? You know, I just recently watched for the first time Saw. Okay. And yeah. that was, and it, I was, exp I think actually, and by recently, I mean it might have been around the Halloween time that, uh, we we just saw that and it was um it was kind of sort of interesting to me because they were it's it was a good movie but they were trying to be clever and it was all about being clever and of yeah. course the, the psychological trauma and and those awful terrible decisions that the people the characters need to make and uh, but um in the context of what you just uh, were saying yeah it's it was very clean it was very you know professional and and uh, they were so busy being clever and doing the psychological tension which we actually made it a very good movie in my opinion but it wasn't the same kind of horror I reserve judgment as to whether you know that's good or bad I'm not a uh, I'm not a horror movie buff as evidenced by the fact that I just saw saw in 2014 what did you think of it it was, I was pleasantly surprised. I was expecting a slasher, and I got, um, I got crazy, insane uh, situations with uh, awful decisions and, uh, and Michael Emerson being evil, so it was uh, great. Well said. Uh, the, 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 the ending, we, my wife and I, we, both, we rolled our eyes at the ending, but you kind of have to in a horror movie. Yeah. I've seen all of the Saw movies, several of them in the theater, and and you have seen the peak of all of them. In fact, that entire genre of, they call it torture porn, that came into existence after Saw, like Hostel and, and all of those, you have not only seen the peak of the Saw movies, you've seen the peak of that entire genre. It's all downhill from there. Agreed. I, I, <laughs> I believe that. Um, definitely, it was one of those movies where the um, the script was really smart and the performances really elevated the material to, uh, you know, which is why it was I was surprised. It was much better than I expected. That ending, though. 
Um, yeah. Is there anything you're reading through the... And I just barely... This is my fault. Um, I didn't mean to do this. I just... Um, I was putting this together during my blackout period before the show started, uh, and I realized, oh, hey, this might be something good to talk about. So I just barely gave uh, Brian and Doran all this link, so they're scanning through it right now while, while we talk. Um, so this may be an unfair question. Is there anything on that list of 15 things that jumps out at you that you think, oh, yeah, exactly, I think exactly that, or even that you think is interesting but wrong? The one thing on the list that jumped out at me, um, all right, two things, but I'll go with the first things first because that's how numbers work, <laughs> uh, is uh, number four, no straight to video. Love that. Uh, peop I mean, people have been movie lovers and movie makers for years and years and years, and um, I don't know, there's, there's something about, I like going to the movies, so there's something about having a film that, films that were made for that setting as opposed to, you know, cheesy, straight to video, now, nowadays it's straight to stream uh, videos. Oh, there's some amazing stuff you can find, um, you know, online and in video, but... I think I've talked about that. Uh, maybe on my blog, maybe here on the show, I don't remember, but talked about how the fact that all the movies have been priced too high means you don't get a chance to have, uh, you know, let's let's say you had a bunch of movies that were second tier movies that instead of charging the full seven or eight or ten bucks, you charged half price no matter when people saw them, and just arranged to have them shown in theaters. You would be willing to risk audience members would be willing to risk more to see a movie that was cheaper just because. It's cheaper, and horror movies would fill that uh, fill that gap perfectly. You wouldn't need to do direct to video stuff. You could release them in the theaters with the expectation that they don't have to do fifty million dollars or a hundred million dollars to break even. Which actually brings me to the two items that really stood out most to me, which are number eight, a sequel free world. Yeah. And tying in closely with number nine, a remake free world. Oh man, because I, I gotta tell you, I am a, a big horror film buff. Except I'm more of a product of my time. I am, admittedly, a fan of 80 slasher flicks. Which, yeah, it sounds a bit hypocritical because that was when the sequel machine really got turning. I mean, Halloween 4 is their example <laughs> of what's wrong with cinema. But um, the thing is, I think that worked for the different kind of horror that the slasher flicks work because. Again, it was a different paradigm. It was it was a different kind of horror. Whereas the 70s was grittier, it was more existential, you know, less jump-scare-laden. But I, I think that uh, that is something that we've unfortunately lost, is that idea that uh, we can just... We, we got a director who wants to tell a story, and we're just going to get that down on film... And that's it. Then we're just going to walk away and do something else, not just milk it indefinitely, like the Saw franchise, for example. I happen to agree with that, too. Yeah, I, I dislike, especially because many of the sequels just seem to be thoughtlessly thrown out there just to be sequels. They're not actually very good movies. And well, I think yeah. Yeah, and, and you guys were just saying that about Saw, that, that the first one was, was the pinnacle. And I think that's kind of the... the when, I saw, when I saw it, I was like, wow, maybe maybe I've been wrong to not watch horror movies for most of my life. You know, maybe maybe they actually make interesting things, and uh, and it's kind of disappointing to see that, nah. They do make good horror movies, just not torture porn. That's the pinnacle of the torture porn genre itself. Um, yeah, if you're looking for good horror movies, I would still look more toward the indie side of the spectrum. I mean, there, there are some guys out there right now where, you know, a couple of college roommates can grab a digital camera and make a movie over the weekend, and it's better than anything Hollywood's putting out now. It's Yeah, in terms of scare, in terms of grabbing you, yeah. Yeah, I have a friend, uh, Tony Washer in Scotchworthy Productions, which is an independent film studio out of Chicago. And a couple years ago, he made a movie called A Chance in Hell. He made it as like a 15-minute, half-hour short, but he shot it at the old Elgin Watch Factory in Elgin, Illinois. It dates back to the 1800s. And he's got a buddy whose uncle owns it or something. 
had another buddy whose dad was a World War II buff and had all sorts of authentic period props and weapons and uniforms. And Tony decided, I want to make an actual Nazi zombie movie. Not because what you get, like up until then, and movies built as Nazi zombie films were like um, Nazis encounter zombies, or there are Nazis and zombies, but not where the Nazis are zombies and the Allies have to fight them. And that's what you get in a chance in hell. You get uh, you know, a squad of American soldiers who get cut off and they're behind enemy lines, run across a secret facility where Nazis have been doing horrifying medical experiments. There's a zombie outbreak, and carnage ensues. He actually managed to shoot it on a, a 2K red cam. It, it looks beautiful. But for many of the reasons you're talking about... Um, as the wine scenes kind of epitomize of the difficulty of finding the money to fund a film. He has been shopping it around. He just cannot get backers to make this into a feature length film like he wants to. It's called A Chance in Hell. It is called A Chance in Hell by Scotch Worthy, just like the drink Scotch and then Worthy. Who's the director? Tony Wash. Okay, I just found it on IMDb. Yeah, check that out. Uh, I'm going to drop links to that article uh, that we're talking about, the 15 reasons the 1970s were the best decade. I'm also going to drop a link to uh, A Chance in Hell, uh, give the audience if you want to see it, or at least, you know, out some more about it, um, give a chance to take a look at it. All right, we are running out of time. Uh, I've got one more thing to do, and but before I do, I want to give either of you a chance, or both of you a chance to... Uh, Say whatever you want to say. Darn, I'll go ahead. Hey, um, I don't have much to say. Thanks for uh, listening in, everybody. Go out, check out some new movies, go to the theater, and see all this old, fun, great crap that we've been talking about, too. Because a lot of it's available on Netflix to stream. You don't even have to work hard. You can just get it. Um, Brian. Well, yes, thank you. One last thing that... My editor, Jason Rennie, at Sci-Fi Journal, will kill me for if I don't mention, is Sci-Fi Journal, the uh, magazine of science fiction and philosophy, is going to be available in paper very soon. You can get it in print. Um, and also, pertaining to that, there has been a small amount of Hugo buzz around Jason Rennie. On various of the superversive... Uh, sci-fi websites that I frequent. Uh, I don't know if anyone here has heard of Larry Correa's Sad Puppies campaign. I have, obviously, but that's because I'm a uh, <laughs> your subversive. Excellent. But yeah, so it's been getting just rave reviews from some really surprising quarters, and it's the antidote to the sort of angsty message fic that's been dragging genre fiction down, so I recommend for everybody to go right out and uh, check out Sci-Fi Journal. It's a uh, file with a P-H-I. Uh, I put a link to it in the description, so you can check you. it out. I will say this. I gave up on science fiction short fiction, short stories in science fiction about 20 years ago, because um, they all were getting depressing and crappy. Um, that means through that stuff, right? <laughs> oh, wait. But uh, I, I checked out the latest issue, issue number three of Sci-Fi Journal. Um, Brian, again, has a short story in it, uh, and I loved it. I loved all the stories, and I love Brian's short story. Um, it is good science fiction, interesting science fiction, thoughtful science fiction, and it's very hard to find any of that anymore. Well, thank you. I'm glad to have entertained you. All right. Uh, let, me, let me conclude, take us out, because we've got just one... Uh, one or two minutes left. Um, my opinion on the 70s is this. There is a palpable aura of menace and threat that hangs over the old horror movies that modern movies just can't duplicate for all the reasons we've covered. They seem like places to go mentally where you have... There's no safe place. There's no rules. There's nothing that you can point to to say, this won't happen or that won't happen or this is beyond the pale. I think with the growth of political correctness and the growth of all of the pushes for various um, uh, various 
content advisories and stuff, however well meant, it takes something away from horror. You don't have that feeling like you're walking into a place mentally where you don't know what will happen because anything can. And I think that eviscerates horror. I think that is what has ruined horror and the gritty, dark movies of the 70s, when you look just at the posters, they radiate a sense of palpable menace because you literally don't know exactly what's going to happen or what can happen. There are no sequels. There are no remakes. So anyone in the movie can be gone in a second. They, a lot of them were great. Many of them were made with A-list actors of the time, even though they were low-budget, gritty movies. You should check the article out. If it gives you, if any of them seem interesting, I would encourage you to look them up, give them a watch, uh, especially Last House on the Left for completely just disturbing horror and the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which is unmatched, uh, one of the best horror movies ever made. I am Daddy Warpig. Uh, with my co-hosts, Brian Niemeyer and Doranal, signing off. Remember, you can check all three of us out on Twitter. Twitter. The links are in the description. Check out uh, brianniemeyer.com and daddywarpig.com. We are here every Sunday night, 7 p.m., the Geekalicious Gab Fest. One hour of all geek, all fun, no work. Daddy Warpig, signing off, we will be back.